Alison, thanks very much for joining us on the Ideas Lab podcast. Oh, it's great to be here, John. Thank you. Now, I know you from the fact that I'm a judge on the uh, Business Book Awards, which is an annual event, and you are head judge. So you are the person who, well, what does the head judge do? I mean, uh, well, yes, I outrank you technically. You do. <laughs> yeah. You know, overturn my decisions. But you're very good at it. And uh, I'm, I'm impressed how you manage, you know, the the, the pressures of everybody, of, of this disorganized bunch of judges who are handing in things late and all that kind of stuff. It's uh, It's good how you manage to produce something coherent out of all of it. But the yeah, Business Book Awards, perhaps you can say something about the Business Book Awards uh, for anybody sure. in a sentence that doesn't know about it. So the Business Book Awards were founded by Lucy McCara and she invited me to be head judge. I was very excited because I think, you know, business book publishing is a sort of Cinderella of the publishing space. Uh, it, it gets very little attention, but actually it's, I think it's where some of the most in- interesting and, and um, creative stuff is going on. So that's very much my, you know, been always been my space. And um, so as a head judge, really, you kind of get to boss the other judges around a bit. <laughs> you know, we, we I don't do um, the initial round of judging. As you know, all the category judges come and there's this huge, uh, intense day in January each year where we get all the piles of books on the table and the judges are looking at the quality of the submissions because you have to sort of submit your application plus the quality of the books and they're shortlisting uh, for each category so I get to read out the shortlists and then the judges take away the books in that shortlist and each of them get read in depth by at least two judges and in an ideal world the judges in each category come up with their winner possibly a runner-up if there's you know a lot of discussion and and that's fine what really happens of course is that there's lots of questions there's lots of oh I'm not sure this book should be in this category or uh you know actually you know I think this but they think that and and so I do quite a lot of arbitration and Mm -hmm. uh and sort of making final decisions and so on. And then once we have the category winners, usually I read all of the category winners and make the selection of the overall business book of the year. This year I couldn't do that because one of my uh, own titles was in the uh, in the category winner, so I had to delegate that bit. Uh, but yeah, that's that's always a, a great privilege and great fun to do. Very hard yeah. job, but very very enjoyable. Which brings on to the next topic. So you are you run a publishing company. Um, Say that again, sir. So you actually are a publisher yourself. You run a publishing yes, company. Yes, So I'm the director of Practical Inspiration Publishing, and we focus on business books um, and also some self-development. And uh, and on top of that, you have this great podcast, which is the Extraordinary Business Book Club. Is that right? That's right, yeah. yeah. And Ridiculously I, long title, I now realize. <laughs> <laughs> it's good, though. And I, so I like how all these things fit together. And I one of the things I, I will ask you maybe a little bit later is how you manage to do all these things. But they do fit together quite nicely. Um, what is how how does uh, your publishing company operate? How does Practical Inspiration approach publishing business books? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. So I've been in publishing all my life. So I started off literally as a graduate. I was um, I was for about a year. I was an author and a bookseller. So writing for Chambers up in Edinburgh and um, in, in Waterstones East End, which is still the best Waterstones. <laughs> and, um, and those are the two pointy bits of publishing. So it was a great introduction to the industry, you know, because you're, you're the creative writer at the one end and you're the bookseller with, with, you know, absolute sort of all you can think about is how you're going to sell this book to the public. So that there's a sort of idealistic end and there's the rank commercialism at the other and having appreciation of both of those. What authors need to know, how insecure they feel uh, and what booksellers need in order to be able to make a sale. You know, both of those are really, really important in publishing. So I started publishing in 92, I think, up in Chambers in Edinburgh. And I've worked with Oxford University Press and uh, Reader's Digest briefly, which is a bit surreal, and Macmillan. So, you know, big traditional publishing companies. And then in 2014, uh, I was Director of Innovation Strategy for Palgrave Macmillan. And really just trying to grapple with, with how publishers should respond to the way that the world was changing. So information suddenly, you know, we weren't the gatekeepers anymore. And there was a sense that, you know, no longer was content a rare commodity. We were all drowning in the stuff. You know, it was attention that was rare. And how do you navigate that when your whole business model is around charging for access to content? And open access was coming and everything. You know, I was I was, um, I, I sort of pioneered digital publishing back in the 90s. So I was putting all that stuff online, but behind paywalls. So it was really complex and, and fascinating and tricky. <laughs> and then Macmillan moved all their offices to London in 2014. And that was kind of a, a, a decision time, you know, do I move to London, which I didn't particularly want to do, you know, I had small children, we're settled in the countryside, or do I do something different? 
And, uh, and originally I was going to completely leave publishing because it seemed so broken and it was a good opportunity to get out, you know. Mm. Um, and I retrained as a coach and um, all as soon as people found this out, all they wanted to talk to me about was publishing their books <laughs> when I was doing business coaching. And so it's sort of practical inspiration was born and it brings together those two passions of mine, which is publishing, because I still love, I mean, I get a real kick out of publishing good books and, and all the, the technical shizzle around that, um, but also the the thing about ideas and helping people really express their ideas more clearly. And so working as a sort of partnership publisher, which is what I do now in Practical in, uh, Inspiration. So we're, we're saying to, to publish to, to authors, let's work together on this. You know, you, it, you treat it as a marketing expense. You treat it as a professional development opportunity. We provide all the traditional publishing infrastructure, you know, not just the production, which is frankly the easy bit, but the, the marketing, the sales, the global distribution, the warehousing, you know, to book the, the reps out to bookshops and so on. And, um, and actually, it's a much more satisfying way to publish because you've got the time and the space to really work on developing the text and to make it work for the, for the author. Mm, right. And um, it, it's a way do you live now, just out of interest? Live near near Basingstoke because that's oh. where McMillan would base like. <laughs> oh, okay. But it's it's lovely. It's North Hampshire countryside. You know, it's it's really pretty. So I, I run a lot, and you know, within a minute, I'm out in open countryside, and it's it's a beautiful place to live. Yeah, I was trying to work out if you were still up north somewhere. I, I know we shared a train once back from the the Business Book Awards. I can't remember where you said you were going. So um, yeah, so you didn't get dragged into London in the end. No, in an entire publishing career, I've got 27 years or something in traditional publishing. I spent 10 months in London with Reader's oh, Digest. I'm quite proud of that. Yeah, that's, that is pretty impressive. Mm-hmm. And so Edinburgh, why... Oxford, Basingstoke. Right, yeah. So, and, and then you, you started the Extraordinary Business Book Club podcast. Uh, why did you do that? And you said you're a big, you've got a big passion for podcasts. I'd love to know more. I about have. Do, do you want the, um, the really good strategic reason or do you want the truth? Uh, I have a truth, I think. <laughs> So I was trying to write my book, This Book Means Business, and it's the most self-conscious, crippling thing in the world to try and write a book about writing a book to build your business, to build your business. <laughs> and so, and of course, you know, I'm a publisher. I'm actually not an author, first and foremost. I'm really good at supporting other people and giving them deadlines and holding them accountable. Terrible for myself. So honestly, I started the podcast to hold me accountable. So I thought if I tell the whole world that I'm writing this book, I'm going to have to write the damn thing. And, and also it was a great way to, um, one way of becoming less self-conscious about writing your book is to see yourself more as a journalist, a kind of a curator, a, a, you know, somebody who's asking questions and researching and finding out about stuff because it takes all the pressure off you. And so this was a great way of getting on uh, really top flight business authors and just being really nosy and asking them what writing looked like for them and, you know, how they made their books work with their business. And honestly, I didn't really care if anybody listened. It was just all about that accountability and that um <laughs> A platform from which to do that kind of research uh, yeah, and reason to call people up and have that conversation that's a great idea and and very early on you had seth godin on didn't you who's a, yes, an amazing author you know, some 30 incredible yeah mm. and i listened to that episode i remember in the gym once and it was it was really interesting um that was one where you finished your podcast and then you restarted was that the one uh, am i remembering right well you finished right. it was hilarious and we he said well and you know we, we really ought talking. to finish and he goes well i'm not going anywhere, I'm not I'm going not. anywhere. <laughs> and he went <laughs> you know do you want to go on a bit longer uh yeah, okay so i switched the mic back on and uh, we had a bit more seth brilliant <laughs> but what great. i found is that actually a lot of people a lot of business book writers a lot of business people love talking about the writing of their book Mm. because they spend a lot of time talking about the content and of course we do a bit of that as well because I want people to understand the context but they're very rarely asked about the process of writing and they love talking about it yeah yeah that's great and how uh, the podcast has helped is it so the podcast it's sort of a strategic part of it was um that it presumably it helps people to understand about practical inspiration publishing yeah, so the post hoc rationalization argument for the podcast is that it's a brilliant um, tool for developing your network professionally and building a following and all that kind of good stuff. And that when people come to me to publish this practical inspiration or to the 10 day business book proposal challenge or for the book coaching stuff that I run, it's not a sales conversation. They're just like, oh, I love the stuff you do. I really want to work with you. Where can we start? And um, for somebody who hates sales conversations like me, that's, that's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we, you mentioned something uh, earlier before we started recording about the power of writing that I thought was rather interesting. So you're a, you're a proponent of writing as an act in itself. Can you explain that? 
Yeah, absolutely. I found when, when you talk about business writing, and if you Google business writing, most people's assumption is that business writing is what you do once you're clear on what you're saying. And it's all about communicating it effectively and being persuasive and, you know, writing reports or presentations or, you know, books, that kind of thing, which is fine. That is absolutely that expressive part is one part of writing. But writing so much bigger than that. And one of the things that I teach people is uh, free writing which was a revelation to me when I discovered it, which is not that long ago, about four or five years ago. And you teach these people and they go, oh, why, why are we not taught this at school? You know, it's, it's just amazing. Can you explain so, it a bit for anybody who doesn't know yeah, it? Yeah, so free writing. If you listen to um, Orna Ross on the Extraordinary Business Book Club podcast, she talks a lot about it as well. So that's that's worth hearing. But And she taught me about that. She uses the acronym. She, she takes free and makes it into an acronym, which is fast, raw, easy, and exact, which I think is quite helpful as well. So the way I do it, is I set a timer for literally five or 10 minutes because actually, you know, my hand can't do longer than that. Mm. <laughs> I'm just out of the habit of writing longhand. Um, and I set myself a prompt like um, I'm really struggling to uh, to work out what to do about this. And I think the reason is, and you just, you give yourself a kind of um, a starting point, a toehold, and then you start writing. So if you've ever written morning pages, have you heard about uh, Julia? Um, yes. Yeah, so, I don't know her surname, that's terrible. But the Julia Cameron's, way. yes. So Julia her Cameron idea is to write three pages of uh, handwritten text every morning, fl- just flow of consciousness, whatever comes into your brain, including, exactly. Straight out I mind. hate this, I don't want to be doing this any longer. This is boring, la, 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 la. Whatever is, whatever is in your, and the idea is that you're just unspooling your thoughts onto paper. And that's a great creativity exercise. But if even, you know, the most hard-headed business person, uh, having that space, which is entirely private, completely judgment-free, it allows you to just follow the thought along. If you're, all you're doing is thinking the thought's going around and you lose it and then you're distracted and it's gone. But if you're unspooling it onto paper, it gives you something to hang on to. And even when you're distracted, you can come back to it. And then you can read back. And by the second page, usually, there's a kind of, and you can watch people doing it. You can see the physical shift in them. They go, oh, and, and they've got something and they've got an insight, something's shifted. And you come out the other end, understanding the issue differently and more deeply, and you have an insight that you didn't have before, you've made a connection that you didn't have before, and then you chuck it in the bin because nobody needs to see this, you know. (laughs) But learning how to use writing, which, for goodness sake, it's the most lightweight, cost-effective tool in the world. It's there at anybody's disposal, five minutes, and and that's really powerful. So I call that the kind of the exploration stage. And then there's also... By the way, before we leave that topic, does it have to be handwritten? I mean, you know... Hey, I'm not going to come and police you. <laughs> it, it, I find it works better if, if you're writing by hand. Um, there's something different about the neurological connection. That kind of hand-brain uh, connection is quite powerful. And it's more kinesthetic. Yeah, I, I actually use... If you must do it on a keyboard, then it's better than nothing. Yeah, I think I, I, when I tried to do the morning pages, I found it so irritating to be writing so slowly that uh, I, the, the version I've come up with now is to use uh, a website called 750words.com. So the numbers, uh, 750words.com. And then uh, it allows you to just, for each day, it, it it's encouraging you to write 750 words and it takes about... Isn't that Buster Benson? Who is it? Buster Benson, I think. Is that his idea or is that... Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I'm sure he was involved in that. He was on the podcast a little while back. And I just... Because he's a big proponent of writing as a thinking tool as well. Mm. So we, you know, we we were absolutely on the same wavelength. But yeah, that was a great idea. Yeah, and, and I really like that. And I use that quite often. I pay $5 a month to have the version. I think it, um, you can use it for free for 30 days, but $5 a month will will get you the version that lasts forever and you can look back at anything, not what I ever do. And it, you know, when I can't work out what I'm thinking, I write because often it's like just a general unease or, or a sense of overwhelm or something. And I don't even know quite what it is. And in the writing of it, I can work out, Oh, this is actually what's bugging me or actually these are all the things that are on my plate when no wonder I'm overwhelmed, but actually only that one is really critical. So like you say, it's a, it's a thinking tool, isn't it? Absolutely. And I think very few of us realise that you can use writing in that kind of completely personal way that nobody else needs to see, uh, because then you can suspend the the critic and the censor and you, you don't have to worry about getting the spelling right. You just have to do the thinking on paper. Um, and actually combining that with drawing, diagrammatising, you know, th- those sorts of things are really, really powerful too. Um, but it's amazing how we're just not really 
taught to do that. So most people don't think to do it. Yeah, we're not taught to think, are we? We're not taught. We're not taught how to be creative or how to think. It was. I don't know if school has changed since I was at it rather a long time ago, but I, I don't get the impression it's changed radically. Uh, it's, these are the sort of things that should be taught at school, I think. So you were saying from that process that there's then another benefit of writing? Yeah, so I sort of see this sort of two-by-two two matrix. I tend to see a lot of the world as a two-by-two two matrix. It's a really, really useful thing. So you've got that kind of unclear internal space, which is all about exploration, where free writing is, you know, is, is kind of at home. And then the things that are still internal, but you're getting clearer, uh, perhaps you you know Seth Godin's a master of this with the, with his blogs actually it's just that sense of just expanding your thoughts so you take that uh, you just become more and more clear but you're still really keeping it in a fairly contained way and then there's the sort of external dimension so when you're really unclear about stuff but you want to expand it out then then things like research talking to people focus groups formulating questions you know those are all really useful activities to do in terms of writing and then that final quadrant is where we kind of think of writing which is the expressive quadrant so that's the engagement quadrant and then you've got expressive which is much more okay i'm clear i'm ready to engage with people Here's the sales copy. Here's the book. Here's the report. You know, here's the presentation, and that's that's that sort of you know. So everything's moving you towards that that place. But the journey is is absolutely part of the thing. It's not just about the output, because I think one of the best reasons for writing a book is is the shift it makes in yourself, the, the mastery of the subject, the deepening of your own understanding of of what it is you do in the world. Seth Godin says something like, um, you know, writing a book is hard. He says. Um, I can't remember what it was, but it was, it was a beautifully structured little piece of writing in itself. It was only like a paragraph. You know, it's right, it's it's hard, and it makes you question yourself, and it takes time, and it's emotional labor, and you should write a book. Yeah, so he was talking about writing why. a book in particular. And he goes, because it, it makes you think through what you're really trying to say. And you can see by the quality of debate online that a lot of people don't really know what they're saying. They don't know... Uh, they don't know quite what the, the argument they're trying to make and they haven't really thought it through. And that's part of the process that you are going through. If you're going to write a business book, you need to think like, well, well what is my standpoint here? It's not a, a brain dump of everything rattling around your head. It may start as that, but it has to take some form eventually and be a, a cogent argument for something. And, um, and, and that's a process you have to learn and it's a it's a great process to do um, seth also said you know at one point um google did an update and and he lost half his traffic to his blog and his blog is you know a really well-known blog for uh, he posts to it every single day and he said it didn't really concern him and he said even if his traffic dropped to zero he would continue to write every single day mm-hmm. and there's something about writing for publication that's different you know, this is quite a different kind of form, isn't it, to what we were talking about with the free writing where nobody sees it, and, you know, possibly not even your partner or, or whatever. Um, definitely not your partner. Definitely not your partner. And then, you know, this other form where you are deliberately writing for publication, whether anybody reads it for, or not. And I'm, I've am i been a, a fan uh, of, I, I often recommend people blog out their nonfiction book and you write it a blog post at a time and they're, People are horrified by that idea, but where do you stand on it? Can you, can you oh, see I'm, the value I'm of it? I'm totally with you. And I also think one of the great tactical reasons for writing a book is, well, for goodness sake, you have to write. If you're running a business in the 21st century, you know, you, you, you are known and discovered by the content you put out into the world. So if you're writing a book, that's the engine of your content strategy. So absolutely. And, and it's not, you don't go straight to the finished chapter and put that up. It doesn't work like that. As I say, you go through that kind of expansive, engaging piece and and you think out loud and then you get feedback on your ideas and you see what lands and and then you create the book. And when you create the book, you've already developed a sense of being known in that space and you've got people who are interested to see what you have to say. I think hiding yourself away in a room and writing a book is just not a strategy for anymore for a business book, even if it ever was. It, that is so true, isn't it? Because when when I, I, got, I got a little bit frustrated when I used to um, – used to run business book writing courses with Jacqueline, who I'm sure, Jacqueline, Jack Burns, who I'm sure you know. Yeah. And um, it would be a bit frustrating because people would come to you and go, well, actually, I just need to go away and write it. And then when it's finished, I'll come talk to you. And they go like, you're going to fail. <laughs> it's like, that's not going to work. It's almost definitely a recipe for failure because uh, if you've never done it before, at least – it's likely to just result in you writing a book nobody wants to publish and possibly nobody wants to read. Um, you, what you need to do is kind of, I would describe it as kind of um, 
uh, almost like a fractal thing. You need to think like, what is the book you're trying to write? And then what is the structure that's going to support? What's the argument you're trying to put out there? And then what is the structure that supports that? And then fill in the content for that structure. Something like that. I mean, it's not always that rigid in my own process. How do you dis- how do you recommend somebody approaches writing their business book? So in the, the boot camp that I run, I, I do say to people, look, you know, find your own way, because one of the things that, about that boot camp is helping you develop your practice as a writer. And not everybody's the same. You know, some people are talking to Michael Neal, who's never planned a book in his life. He just sits and writes. <laughs> Slightly hate the man. But, is that Michael but, Neal in the States? Yes. The, the coach. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love his stuff. Uh, the, 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 the inside revolution, or the inside out mm. revolution, yeah. Um, but the, the way that m- works for most people most of the time And the way that I teach, but say, look, you know, play with it, see what works for you, is that we get the table of contents, which comes out of the proposal. And then we drill down and we create a working table of contents, which is essentially the skeleton of the book. But go right down to kind of, okay, what is the core idea in each paragraph in this section? And you give it a kind of sense of, well, roughly how long is this section as well? Because until you have that, you don't know when to stop writing. (laughs) But if you if you know that, if you know there's the shape the skeleton the structure of the whole book in detail and roughly how long each section's got to be you can write so much more easily you don't have to sit down and and think well you know is this the right thing to be writing about or you know does it go here or does it go somewhere else or have I repeated myself you can just get on and write and that that's a much more efficient way of writing because you can then use 10 minutes waiting for a flight or something you know but you just got to do 300 words on this and you can do it so much more easily and then you can use it in your uh, in what you're putting out in your articles and um and actually the process of writing a book is is good material in itself you know the things that you notice the the trauma of choosing a cover you know all of those things are interesting as well i think when you're writing a book it's such a it's intrinsically interesting creative enterprise and people are attracted to that. So I think if you do go away and write your book without telling anybody, it's it's a such a wasted opportunity as much as anything. Even if you do end up succeeding, which, as you say, is less likely. Yeah, and, but, but but if you're going to come up with this lovely structure and and then you know fill it in methodically, which would be a very good idea. Um, how do you come up with that initial concept though that says yeah. I want to write a book about this? How do you know you've got a good idea? Well, partly I was going to say, actually, it's kind of iterative because you, you do that structure out, but it's it's a living thing and it will change every time and it should change every time as you write because that's part of the reason for writing. But in terms of how you come up with the concept, I say most people just start with what they um, have the itch to write about or what they know they can write quite easily at the moment. I'd say that's one part of it, but I'd say there's three main parts. One is your stuff, you know, your experience, your expertise, your way of looking at the world, your fascination pile, you know, the, the things that make you you, the things you want to write about. Because if you don't want to write about something, frankly, you know, it ain't going to happen. But then the other thing is, well, what are the people that you want to write for, which for most business authors is the people you want to work with. You know, if, if there's a disconnect there, you've got a problem. Um, what do they care about? What, what are they struggling with? What's an acute pain point for them? You know, what do they come and ask you? What do they not get? What's What are they searching for in their own journeys? Because actually, you know, they're the hero of this book. You're, you're the guide. Donald Miller's got a great thing about that in, in How to Build a Story Brand. Um, so what are they asking you? What do they care about? You know, what, what's the stuff that, that, um, that they want to read about? Because there's no point you writing about stuff they don't want to read about. And then the final final bit, which I think a lot of people forget, is the context bit. So this is the, the, the future, if you like, sort of where are we and where are we heading? What are the trends that are coming up? I mean, for goodness sake, disruption is, is everywhere. You know, how does that play out in that intersection of what you've got and what you work on, what they've got, and what they're facing, what's coming up down the line um, that they don't even know they don't know yet, but, you know, you can sort of point towards. So I think if you've got a book that sits in that intersection of those three areas, you've got it made. And that's also that latter part is important because it's going to help you with marketing. Because if you can say you need to read this book now, or if you can say to a journalist, people need this book now because this is what's happening. This is the book of the age. You know, if you had a book coming out right now that was about, uh, I don't know, race, for instance, because of the recent uh, protests, it would it would be like, okay, you want to make sense of what's happening? Then read this book and it's going to give an incredible force to, to, to what you're doing. Or, or similarly, if you're writing a book that was about, um, you know, science's journey to 
truth and and dealing with large scale public health issues like the coronavirus, which it's done a kind of patchy job on, unfortunately, with the WHO giving confusing instructions and so on. You could write a really interesting book about that. And okay, sometimes you only know that afterwards because what's in the news is a little bit late. But we can see the big trends. I mean, I you can I, see the big trends. You know, and, the, and you can see how they play out in your space as well, which maybe m- more people aren't writing about. You yeah. know, there's the, the books about the big topics, but then there's the, the opportunities around the edges for how those big topics play out in certain areas. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. So when you work with publishers, how so with, with authors, how do you work with them? So you've got a book, a boot camp to help them actually write the book. Is that right? Well, so I run um, about three times a year. <clears throat> Although I'm actually running one in the summer because I don't normally do programs in the summer, but hey, nobody's going anywhere this summer, so I thought I might as well. <laughs> but I run a 10 day business book proposal challenge, which is brilliant. I mean, I, it's one of those ideas you have and you just think, oh, this is going to work brilliantly. And it did. And I, I've done it for about three and a half, four years now. And it's literally over 10 days when we just go through a book proposal because everything that a publisher needs to know about your book, you need to know about your book. Who is it for? What problem is it solving for them? What's your marketing plan here? How do you put it across, you know, in a succinct summary? So, by the end of 10 days, you've got a book proposal, which in itself is great because then you can pitch your book. Uh, but more importantly, you've done that thinking. And of course, you have a table of contents. So each book proposal I run afterwards, I, re- I run a boot camp, which is only open to people who have graduated from that book proposal challenge. So you've built up this fantastic energy and trust and, and a sense of people being at the same stage, which is just dynamite then for the boot camp. So that's a six week thing of saying, OK, we'll start with that high level table of contents. We spend the first three weeks bottoming it out. What does that actually look like? What's the macro structure and what's the kind of micro structure within each section? What do we need to cover here? Doing lots of post-it work. <laughs> and, um, and then we have a week off to recover. And then on the final half of the boot camp, it's all about the writing. And it's particularly about how you... Um, how you start using that content in your content strategy. It's also about the network strategy. So we have a kind of on the book strand, which is the strategic piece, and an in the book strand, which is the structure and the writing piece. Uh, I don't know if you know Michael Gerber's point about writing, uh, working on the business and in the business. Uh, so yeah, so the on the book stuff, we're talking about your, your network plan, your, your mindset, your marketing stuff, a lot of marketing, uh, publishing strategy, uh, and, you know, and the content strategy. So that's all the kind of stuff around how you use the book in your business. So th- those are kind of two core programs that I do. Um, but I also, of course, work with people as a publisher, in which case, um, consulting or coaching is, is part of that package, because I kind of can't help myself. So I might as well do it formally. Yeah. <laughs> And that's where we start. I always, my, like you, my heart sinks slightly when someone says, oh, I finished the manuscript. I just need a publisher. And you think, oh, I wish you'd come to me sooner. <laughs> I know. Yeah. No, that's a really good idea because starting with a proposal in your your 10-day proposal challenge, I, I might do that actually because Jacqueline's trying to persuade me to to start thinking about book four now, which is actually a very good idea rather than waiting until, you know, a year from now. Um a year after book three comes out. So, uh, you know, the proposal challenge is a good idea because like you say, what is it? It's kind of a marketing document, but you marketing yourself to a publisher. It's a pitch. Yeah. It's a pitch, but it's also a pitch to anybody else who might read it. Cause the same, if you can get that right, then part of what you've got to be able to do is explain it to the press or to a reader. And so those are the three audiences, really the publisher, the press and the reader. And, um, and if you can get that right and write a proposal makes people go, oh, wow, yeah, this is good, then that's a book worth writing, uh, which is the opposite way around. So it's kind of um, opposite way around to those examples we've given of people locking themselves away in a bedroom and writing yeah. a book on spec. So, And you talked about marketing. You mentioned marketing in passing. Uh, what's your latest thinking in, in marketing books? Because that, that is very much where my head is going to now. Now the book's coming out in July. It might, next book is coming out from Pearson in July. Um, so what's your latest thinking on how how to market books and what do you recommend to clients? We've spent a lot of time recently working with um, the book sellers and the reps, particularly as bookshops have been closing. It's some really imaginative, you know, sort of stuff with online supply. We've been offering big, bigger discounts to, to booksellers to help kind of, you know, keep that up. Because for us, non-Amazon 
the supply chain is really, really important because these are the people who really, really care about books. So we do a lot, you know, with the buyer's guides, with the information that goes out, with the meta- metadata. Metadata is key. That's really, really important. So if your publisher isn't doing a good job with metadata, then you get onto it. And the, the book proposal is, is the basis of that. So it's really, really worth getting it right. So that, there's a sort of book trade bit of marketing that um, I think most authors, particularly self-publishing authors, don't really engage with or think about. They just think about Amazon. And Amazon's a big piece of the puzzle, but it's not the whole piece. Mm-hmm. So just that out the way and the other thing is that actually again it's that it's that um long neck as opposed to the long tail that we were talking about earlier that period while you're writing the book that is the golden time to really build up the marketing for the book is the time to start building your community you know your email list to get people engaged with it to get the website up to uh, involve as many people as you can so you know from the podcast obviously you're you're, you're sort of reaching upwards and you're getting well <laughs> it's like <laughs> how presumptuous of me but you know what i mean you're getting people on who've got something to say about the yeah. topic but you also you're reaching outwards to people in related fields, people who might want to run a JV with you, you know, a joint webinar where you're talking about um, Michael Gerber does this brilliantly. You know, he does the kind of the, the e-myth for dentists, you know, and creates all those little kind of um, relationships around it. And then there's the reaching I don't believe stop using up and down actually because that's not terribly helpful but the building the community you know it's like who are the people you're speaking to the people who are following you rather than the kind of people who are perhaps you know leading in their field that you're talking to at the um, at higher level so how do you build that up where do you build that up you know thinking about what suits you so a podcast suits me beautifully it wouldn't suit everybody um, a LinkedIn group might be right for you, in which case good luck because I think they're really hard to do a Facebook group you know might be IGTV so it's about finding you can't do everything. Uh, it's about finding the, the home for you and doing it really, really well, really consistently and building up that. Um, the people who share your passion and, you know, you can only do that with really, really consistent, good quality content. And then the book comes and, you know, in, in a sense, that's you, you've done the bulk of your marketing because there's people that are wanting to hear it. Yeah, and that would be a surprise for some people that you actually need to start thinking about marketing before the book's published. Yeah. And... Um, uh, and that is a really key thing. So you need to be out there you know, talking about the same things that are in your book and maybe talking about the writing process and, like you say, building a following around that and people who are interested in these ideas so that when your book comes out, you've actually got people to who are ready to buy it. And, and at uh, the most crudely tactical hmm. level, if you want to do an Amazon bestseller campaign, it all depends on your email list. So a bestseller campaign being pushing people to all buy it on day one, is that right? Yeah, you, you know, you reduce the Kindle price to 99p or 1.99 if it's a very illustrated big file and you coordinate as many people as you can to just purchase on that one day. It's not the algorithm algorithm for Amazon isn't quite as crude as the number sold in an hour. You think that is what it means, but it doesn't. You know, they 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 um they include previous sales. They sort of degrade the weighting of them. It's also to do with what, you know, it, it, there's a whole, I mean, the, they're famously opaque, but the key element of it is, can you get enough people to buy it in that short period of time to put it to the top of a, of a category? And it's tactical, it's crude, it's, it's, I'm not saying it's pretty, but it is effective, but it all depends on having a group of people that you can mobilise, and that really depends on an email list or a community like a Facebook group. Yeah, yeah, I think a Facebook group is a good edition mm-hmm. as well and i think i know some people like to have um a kind of launch team which i've created although yeah, um, i'm not i haven't really started doing much in there yet but the idea is if people just like you and like your work and are willing to do uh, help in a little way like buy the book at a particular time then um or, or request it in a local bookshop then that's good to have an army of people who are willing to do that And uh, And that's when the fact that it's a book really, really helps because, you know, you couldn't do that with every product and every widget out there. But but people really do love being involved in in book campaigns. There is something really magical that and and culturally, you know, we we get excited about books and we should, you know, they they matter. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, that's fantastic. And if people want to know more about what you're doing, when is the next uh, proposal challenge, the 10-day proposal challenge, is that what it's called? Well, it's funny you should say that because literally yesterday I just thought, you know what, I should do something this summer. So the next scheduled 10-day business book proposal challenge and the next classic running of it is going to be on the uh, 20th of September, I think it is. And you, I, I can just give you a sign-up link for that. But I'm also going to be running a kind of summer. I'm calling it This Summer Means Business. It's sort of a nod to my This Book Means Business. And it's the proposal challenge followed immediately by the virtual writing retreat that I started running at the beginning of the um uh, corona crisis so it's it's basically a month of you know two weeks getting a proposal nailed two weeks after that with some support and 
accountability to do some actual writing. So hopefully by the end of the month, um, you'll have really got a long way with your book. I just have to work out how I fold the boot camp into that if I do. <laughs> that's, the, yeah. that's still a bit of a work in progress at the moment. But yeah. I think that, you know, that should be helpful for people who aren't going anywhere this summer and want to use the time really constructively. So that will start on the 20th right. of July and run through to so basically the last two weeks in July for the proposal challenge, the first two weeks in August for the virtual writing retreat. Or you could do either or. Yeah. OK. And uh, your book is still out there. This book means business. I reduced it to 99p on Kindle at the start of the crisis. I have kept it there because actually, you know, it's selling really well. I I just want people to, to use this yeah. time and this space if they have it. I mean, you know, many people have much time, less time and much less space than usual because they're homeschooling. <laughs> but if you have got time and space and, and it's and it's helping you kind of re-evaluate your priorities and, and turning it into to write the book that you've been talking about for too long, then, um, then go and grab it because it's still 99p on Kindle and will be for, you know, probably till the end of um, the summer. Yeah, no, great tip. And otherwise, where should people go to find out about you and the podcast and Practical Inspiration? So there are three sites, I'm afraid. It's alisonjones.com, it's practicalinspiration.com, and it's extraordinarybusinessbooks.com for the podcast. Good. Okay, well, we'll put all those links underneath. And thank you very much. It's been fantastic, Alison. I, I, great oh, to talk to you. I've got to ask one more question, which I forgot to ask. How do you do all this? You have children and a partner as well. How how do you do this? <laughs> uh, it all works together. What what uh, what I don't what I find difficult is prioritizing my own writing. So I have to get up daft o'clock in the morning to do that. But um, yeah, I know that you know doing the podcast feeds the content strategy, so that that makes complete sense. And and you know all the business development stuff and publishing the books. I have a great team. You know the practical shout out to the practical inspiration team. You know my market, I've got a marketing manager, production assistant. We use a great production and design team. We've got our reps. You know the team when we all get together for our kind of twice yearly meetings. There's about twenty people in the room. So you know that's not all just me, which is great because it takes a book to it takes a village to, to raise a book. Um, but I think, you know, it's that whole thing when you do what you love, you don't ever really work again. <laughs> I know that well, sounds really trite, but it's no. true. No, well, that's basically the theme of my book. So uh, uh, I'm not going to argue with that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Sure. Well, let's play. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, well thanks, Alison. I really appreciate that. Great to talk to you, John.